So, I know many of you have probably been following this election cycle, and for those of you who have been, no matter what your political views are, I think we can all agree on one thing. It's kind of a mess. The rhetoric and polarizing ideologies we see from candidates on all sides makes you wonder, how did we get here? Well, if we go all the way back to 2008, you see the United States nominees were always in the top right section of the political compass, but there was a clear distinction between Democrats and Republican nominees. Going to 2012, we see that distinction is less clear, with all the nominees moving further and further up to the top right. Finally, we're at 2016, and the Republican nominees have completed their migration all the way to the top right corner. But uh, Clinton is about where Bush, the second Bush that is, and Obama were, and Sanders is very far to the left relative to the other ones. So this makes people begin to ask, are we seeing a rise in extremism in the United States politics? Are we seeing radicalism from the left and conservatism from the right? Or one that you might hear less often, is this an increase in fundamentalism? The reason you might not hear that one as often is because we normally associate fundamentalism as a religious or a viewpoint or ideal. But in fact, I'm here to show you that it's more than that. It can apply to any ideology and it's something that we need to be aware of and be on guard for. Let's start with a couple of definitions. Oxford Dictionary and Dictionary.com define fundamentalism as a religious point of view based on literal interpretation of scripture. Uh, the Free Dictionary and Merriam-Webster Dictionary define fundamentalism as based on a set of principles and the rigid adherence to those principles. When you combine those definitions, you get a more complete idea of what fundamentalism is. Fundamentalism is an ideology that is based on a single scripture or document at its core, takes a single, what they call literal uh, interpretation of it, and claims that that interpretation is entirely inerrant and cannot be challenged. No change or new information can be used to change that opinion. The second part of fundamentalist viewpoints is that that scripture and those ideas are then taken to create a set of basic principles. And anyone who follows that fundamentalist point of view has to use those principles to guide every action they make. They have to derive their beliefs and their values and their opinions and guide their daily lives by looking to those basic sets of principles. Now if you think about this, no two people ever read the same book or the same document the same way. We all hear different things in songs, we all feel different emotions when we look at a piece of art because every single thing we do is based on our individual experiences. So, how can we have something based on a specific single interpretation of a text? Well, first, let's start looking at what holy texts really are for, which brings us up to the question, what is religion for? Religion is a way for us to understand a shared communal experience of faith. It's a way for people to express their belief in that there's something greater out there. And holy books such as the Bible and the Vedas and the Quran and the Torah and many more that I can list off endlessly are used as a way to guide us through this process. It's a way to help us communicate with other people who share our same point of view about this communal experience of faith. In the United States, 3% of the population is atheist, 4% is agnostic. The other 93% is religious. 70% is Christian, 15% is unaffiliated, meaning they're religious but don't adhere to a specific doctrine. The others fit into some small percent in that pie chart on the left. What that means is that religion has not died out. Religion is still a powerful force in our society and people still have ideologies based on these religious doctrines. I want to zone in on that 70% Christian for a minute. If we look down here, you've got that broken up further into Catholic, Evangelical Protestant, Mainline Protestant, and many more on this chart. So if a single document is only able to be read in a one literal manner, how can we get all these variety of denominations? How come a variety of sects exist in every single religion possible? Well, some might say that their interpretation is right. For example, a Protestant might say that his interpretation or his pastor or his priest's view of what the Bible says is correct, while the Catholics and the Pope might argue that only what they say is correct and anyone else is incorrect. But either of them would be able to prove the other one wrong because both of them would go to the same book the same passages, and the exact same words to prove their argument. And so there's no way for either of them to deem that their view is the more correct one. And yet, a fundamentalist movement known as biblical literalism has emerged. 
That's as simple as it sounds. They look at every single word in the Bible as a literal history textbook, so to speak, which doesn't make sense for two reasons. First, in every single religious scripture, there are historical inaccuracies. In the Bible, there are four different stories for how Jesus and where he was born. So that doesn't make sense from a historical perspective, and, but it's an entirely faith-based matter of whichever you believe. The second thing is, back when the Bible was written and back when all the religious scriptures were written, history didn't exist the way we viewed it. History was about truth and moral and um, emotional stories. It's about conveying a purpose and a message rather than conveying an actual event. And so when the people who wrote the Bible wrote down these stories, they wrote it down with the purpose of transferring a feeling and a message and a meaning, not a literal historical event. However, the biblical literalist movement takes the stories and states that they absolutely happened. They refuse any alterations, any scientific evidence or historical evidence to the contrary, and they refuse to look at any viewpoints that are outside of the literal words of the Bible. This movement limits their ability to view things beyond what they believe and beyond what's in the Bible. Now, this, now you're probably wondering, I've been talking about religion for about five minutes. What the hell does this have to do with politics? Well, let me show you. There's a type of movement in politics called strict constructionalism, or in U.S. history we call it strict constitutionalism after the document on the left. It is defined by the Social Studies Help Center as an approach that holds judges and politicians should confine themselves to applying those rules clearly stated or clearly implied by the language of the Constitution. What this means is that people like, who follow it, like Thomas Jefferson, can only make decisions based on what is exactly stated within the Constitution. They cannot extrapolate beyond that. They cannot make decisions based on their own personal experience, nor based on changes in the time. Which, when you think about it, doesn't make sense, considering our Constitution has amendments in place to allow us to make changes as time progresses. In fact, Thomas Jefferson himself was unable to sustain that viewpoint because he was sustained with a decision of whether or not to go through with the Louisiana Purchase. And as we all know, Louisiana is now a state. He broke his own viewpoint in order to allow the country to move forward and in order to adapt to the times. But we don't have to go all the way into history to be able to look at this. Let's look at the Second Amendment that's causing a lot of controversy. I'm not trying to impose a viewpoint on you, but I'm going to talk about the most fundamentalist viewpoint that I don't think anyone out there is even supporting. A very fundamentalist viewpoint with gun control would state that since it's anything that to defend ourselves, we should all have nukes and drones at our beck and call. Obviously, that wouldn't end well, and that's what no one is advocating for. But it shows how the most fundamentalist viewpoints aren't even sustainable as technology develops. The Second Amendment was written at a time when muskets and knives were the most dangerous things around. So they could, the founders couldn't possibly have imagined like machine guns and other weaponry that can be used to hurt people. Therefore, even the most extreme views on either side of the debate now cannot even match what a truly fundamentalist view is because it is simply unsustainable. The final example I want to look at is the recent departed Justice Scalia and the fact that when he departed, many in the House and the Senate said that they would not even have a hearing for whatever nominee Obama put forth. However, when he put Judge Garland forth, who is more moderate and known to be able to make compromise between both parties, there are still many who oppose this. However, many have spoken up, either anonymously or publicly, saying that they would at least have a hearing for the, justice, uh, for the judge in order to evaluate whether he has merits the position. The basis of not having the hearing is a very fundamentalist viewpoint. It's based on the fact that their narrow opinion is the only opinion that is correct, and they use, a <clears throat> they use old evidence and strict beliefs that are not challenged in order to make their decisions. So what? Now that we know what fundamentalism is, why does it matter? Why does it matter that you know how to identify it? Well, now that you know what fundamentalism is, you realize it's resistant to any form of change. And the fact of the matter is, for anything to survive, it needs to adapt. That's why species evolve. That's why ideas change and grow over time. That's why we allow science and new in innovations to affect our ideas. It's why we're all here, in order to learn new things, to change the way we act, and to change the way we live. Societies would crumble unless they adopted new regimes, unless they adopted new technologies and ideas. However, fundamentalist viewpoints stifle that change. They limit our ability to grow. They limit our ability to develop our mindset and our ability to survive through any adversity. So if you ever see someone advocating a viewpoint that seems to you as if they're unwilling to accept other alternatives, that seems to you that they're willing to ostracize other viewpoints simply because it's not within the limited narrow scope of the document they base their opinion off, 
then you have to act with caution. You have to act carefully and defend your own opinion, no matter what your opinion is, as long as your opinion allows for the uh, discussion. As long as your opinion allows you to hear evidence and hear other people's inputs, then your opinion should be for over a fundamentalist viewpoint. Thank you.